Welcome to New Possibilities. I speak truth to power without fear. So yesterday I read this article in The Guardian about a black activist by the name of Rakim Bulagan. And what I want to do is read some excerpts from this article. I'm going to summarize other sections of the article and then I'm going to provide my commentary. So the article says Rakim Bulagan thought he was dreaming when armed agents in tactical gear stormed his apartment, startled awake by a large crash and officers screaming commands, he soon realized his nightmare was real, and he and his 15-year-old son were forced outside of their Dallas home wearing only underwear. Handcuffed and shaking in the cold wind, Balagon thought a misunderstanding must have led the FBI to his door on December 12, 2017. The father of three said he was shocked to later learn that agents investigating domestic terrorism had been monitoring him for years and were arresting him that day in part because of his Facebook posts criticizing police. Now this article goes on to talk about how there was a secretive U.S. surveillance effort uh, tracking so-called black identity extremists. A report was leaked in August 2017 and basically the report claimed that there was a resurgence in ideologically motivated violent criminal activity stemming from African Americans' perceptions of police brutality. Now this article makes some other points, which I'll get to in a second. Um, one thing that happened like after this report was released, a lot of civil rights groups expressed outrage because they were concerned about this whole effort of going after black identity extremists being used to go after groups like Black Lives Matter and other activists. Now it's important to note that you know the charges against him were dismissed and he was uh, released but after he was released, you know, he faced several problems, including losing his home, losing his job, you know, spending time away from his newborn daughter. So this has real implications, real implications on his life and all that kind of stuff. So let's talk about this. You know, the, the reason why this is so important is because it has an impact on all of us, all of us who speak out on social justice issues, all of us who use our social media to talk about politics, to talk about police brutality, to talk about the conditions facing the black community. If they can do this to this brother, then they can easily do it to us. And that reminds me of the saying, if they come for them in the morning, they're going to come for us at night. You know, it starts off with a few test cases. And then later on, we see that there's a relentless effort to destroy the black liberation movement in this country. And this is nothing but a modern day COINTEL program. That's what it is. And those of you who are familiar with COINTEL Pro, you understand that that was an effort to destroy the black liberation movement in this country. They went after civil rights activists. They went after black power advocates. They went after black nationalists. They didn't really make those distinctions. They just went after any black person who was fighting for justice, any black person who was fighting to end police brutality, to end poverty, can, you know, fighting against black people who were speaking out against the war in Vietnam. They declared war on the black community. They arrested many black leaders on trumped up charges. They killed black leaders under the COINTEL program. And this is nothing but a continuation of this. And it's very important to note that although there are political differences between the Democrats and the Republicans, this brother was under surveillance during the Obama administration, and he was arrested under the Trump administration. So you have a continuation of this monitoring of black activists under both Trump and uh, Obama. You have this uh, aggressive anti-black liberation uh, effort under both, you know, Obama and Trump. So in that particular situation, these party titles mean very little. It was under Obama that you had 
groups like Black Lives Matter under surveillance. So that's something that's very important to realize. You know, again, although elections are very important, although there are clear distinctions between the two parties, this is an example of where, unfortunately, the leaders in government, regardless of their party, are on the same page when it comes to going after black activists. Now, this brings me to another point, and that's about people like Alex Jones. You know, this is a prime example of why black people should not be supporting these right wing conspiracy wackos like this guy, Alex Jones. You know, this guy is a misinformation agent. And we see by this example that this information that this guy put out here on his YouTube channel, on his Infowars, was used against black people. It was used to arrest this brother on some trumped up charges. You know, this guy, Alex Jones, often promotes these conspiracy theories and underlying a lot of this stuff is an anti-black sentiment. You know, this man has an anti-Black Lives Matter attitude, an anti-black protesters attitude. So anybody that aligns with the Alex Jones needs to have their, their brain examined. You know, this guy is a misinformation agent, and I wouldn't be surprised if this guy did not collaborate with the FBI and other law enforcement officials. You know, also a couple of other things need to be brought up about this, you know, this issue involving um, the brother Rakim Balagar. And that's this. I mean, you have the NRA a group that's supposed to be about gun rights. You know, not too long ago, I did a video about Killer Mike going and doing an interview with um, the NRA, and they talked about gun rights this and gun rights that, you know, trying to get black people under their sway of influence. But the fact of the matter is the NRA is never standing up and advocating for any black gun owners. You know, this brother is a part of the Huey P. Newton Gun Club, a group that advocates self-defense, a group that advocates on behalf of black gun owners. Where was the NRA when this brother was arrested? Where was the NRA when Lando Castile was killed? Where was the NRA when um, Alton Sterling was gunned down by the police? It seems like the NRA is conveniently absent when black lives are taken. The NRA is conveniently absent when black gun owners' rights are in question. And that should cause people to wake up when it comes to the NRA. The NRA is an organization that's all about white gun owners' rights. It's not about the American people's right to bear arms. So let's be perfectly clear about this. Another thing is this. I mean, the fact that they began monitoring this brother, you know, monitoring his Facebook posts and all that kind of stuff, raises all kinds of uh, civil liberties concerns. I mean, everybody has a democratic right to participate in any protest. Nobody should be uh, under surveillance for participating in a nonviolent protest. People have the right to speak freely. People have the right to assemble and march. People should not be subjected to government suppression, government surveillance, and government oppression and repression simply for expressing their political opinions. And then another thing, I mean, the FBI was monitoring his brother's Facebook posts. And that just makes me question Facebook, period, in their alliance with the government. I mean, in their alliance with these other types of groups that have gathered all kinds of information about people. We, we know about the situation involving Cambridge um, Analytica, where they gathered all this information against people's will, uh, you know, gathered information about hundreds of thousands of people that was used for the Trump administration. And it just makes me question about, like, how safe is the information that we put on Facebook? Now, I don't know if his Facebook posts were public or not, but I know that often you have people that may post things privately, and then it gets out here publicly. And, you know, that just makes it clear. You have to assume that anything you post on Facebook is going to be public information. That's how you have to operate, unfortunately. 
And you have to vet who you allow to be your friends on Facebook. I mean, a lot of these people may be posing as friends and they are just agents gathering information about you. So that's very important. And, you know, the fact that they would target this brother for surveillance based on his participation in one rally. And, you know, that should wake all of us up and make us realize that if they come for this brother, then they can come for us, as I said before. You know, I would not be surprised if people like me are not on some list. You know, and that kind of reminds me of this song that um, Talib Kweli put out where years ago where he was talking about how he's probably on some government list for his rhyming. And I'm sure that those of us who speak about these political issues, we may be under surveillance. We may be on government lists. You know, if you are challenging the system in any kind of real concrete way, they are going to respond by putting you under surveillance and doing whatever they can to neutralize you. Now, if you're not a threat, you don't have to worry about that. And a threat could be anything from changing the way people think to motivating people to take action against racism in society. So that's that's another thing. And then also, we have to look at this whole so-called war on terrorism and how it is basically at a point where they can weaponize that so-called war against terrorism and use it against all kinds of people. So people thought, well, you know, they're just going after those Muslims, you know, when they had the Patriot Act, when they took away certain civil liberties and all that kind of stuff. They said, well, that's just the Muslims over there. That only applies to those Muslims, those Middle Eastern people and this and that. But we are seeing with this example of how they are using these different laws to label black people who are fighting for justice, who are fighting against discrimination, to label them as terrorists. And if we allow them to label this brother as terrorists, I mean, as a terrorist, who's to say if we won't be labeled, um, who's to say we will not be labeled as terrorists later and targeted like terrorists for simply speaking out and demanding justice and demanding equality in this society. You know, this article is also very important because it points out how black people are not the ones killing police. It points out how white people are the ones killing more police than any other group of people for the most part. And I'm going to go to that section in this article where it points this out. It says this, it says, the government's own crime data has largely undermined the notion of a growing threat from black identity extremist movement, a term invented by law enforcement. In addition to an overall decline in police death, most individuals who shoot and kill officers are white men. And white supremacists have been responsible for nearly 75% of deadly extremist attacks since 2001. So that's very important for a couple of reasons. Number one, you know, there is a completely different reaction when it comes to white people. You know, the police shoot first and ask questions later when it comes to black people, but yet they coddle white people, you know, who have weapons. You know, they don't rush in and kill them and gun them down. Like that situation in Oregon where you had these um, these militia type people pointing automatic weapons at law enforcement, but yet they walk away alive. Yet they end up having charges against them dismissed. That's how they deal with them. I mean, and then you had the situations where you had people who shoot up churches like that guy Dylan Roof. After doing that, he walks away alive. After that guy shot up that school in Parkland, he walked away alive. After that Waffle House killer shot those people, those black people in that Waffle House, he walked away alive. They have a completely different reaction when it comes to their own. When it comes to black people, again, they shoot first and ask questions later. We saw this with Philando Castile. We saw this years ago in New York with um, um, 
Amadou Diallo, where they shot at him 41 times. We saw this not too long ago in the case of um, Stefan Clark, where they shot that brother in the back, saying that he had a, they thought he had a gun when he all he had was a cell phone. So there's a difference in treatment. And then also in terms of the police, I mean, we hear all these reports of these white people who are killing police, but yet they want to depict the black man as the one who is posing the greatest threat to the police. While they have stopped monitoring and focusing on these white supremacists who pose the greatest threat, they are a greater threat than um, these Middle Eastern foreign terrorists they are a greater threat than these so-called black identity extremists who do not really exist. But yet the government doesn't prioritize fighting against these white supremacist extremists. As I said in this article, it says that nearly 75% of deadly extremist attacks are committed by these white supremacists, but yet the government is not focusing on them. That tells you about this government's priorities. It tells you about this government's allegiance. You know, this is, after all, a Trump administration that has openly embraced the white supremacist movement, that has openly pandered to the white supremacist movement. And it is no coincidence that that movement is supported, um, you know, and supports Donald Trump. It was that movement that did Nazi salutes, the alt-right, who did Nazi salutes to celebrate the election of Donald Trump. It was people like David Duke who celebrated the election of Donald Trump. It was groups like the KKK who openly endorsed Donald Trump. This man panders to these white supremacists, so I'm not surprised that this man under his leadership would de-emphasize the need for law enforcement to focus on white supremacists. This is a man, after all, who talked about how those extremists in Charlottesville were some very fine people. So with that, I'm going to close out. Tell me what y'all think. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. Peace.